Good morning. Welcome to Madison Avenue Christian Church. Whether you're worshiping here in person or online from home, we are so glad that you are here this morning for World Communion Sunday. If you are visiting with us, we ask that you fill out the perforated part of our bulletin and place it in the offering plate so we can get to know you a little better. Our first announcement today is from our mission department chair, Diane Farrell. Good morning. Um, we had our health fair cookout this past Monday, and Simon asked me to say a few words to let you know all how it went. Um, like some of you out there, public speaking is not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> Sometimes my heart tends to beat a little on the faster side when I try it. But I know quite a few of you have had the AED training, and if things get too out of control, I'm sure one of you will leap up here and put that training into action. <laughs> I'm happy to say everything worked really well that night. I always wanted to work out well, especially on health fair night. Um, earlier in the morning that day, the weather was drab and gray, and I thought, if it rains, this just isn't really going to work out all that well. But when I got to Mac, the sun came out, Ernest hit all the tables and chairs and the grill outside, and everything was shaping up for a good turnout. A little later, our parking lot started to fill up with nurses, and I do mean fill up. We had the parking lot full of tables and chairs, and I think altogether we had about 35 nurses here. Um, they did 140 different health screenings and gave out information. The Northern Kentucky Health Band was here, and we also had fire trucks for the kids to enjoy. Um, Earl, along with Dick Munson, manned the grill, and Charlene, Shelley, Amy, and I did the serving line. Uh, Max served dinner to about 210 people that night. We had a great turnout, and a lot of people got medical attention and information who probably wouldn't, and a hot meal. It is absolutely one of my favorite things that Mac does. There is a spirit of joy in the air, a lot of smiles, and I think our community really enjoys it along with our volunteers. And I think they would all agree that we get a lot more joy out of it than we put into it. So in closing, I just want to thank all of our amazing volunteers and caring nurses who gave their time, and not only for the health fair night, but all the nights that people come down and serve dinners and the nurses that come and man the clinic. So with that, I'll say that I'm looking forward to the next one. And someone can now go and put the ADE back on the shelf. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Our 2023 stewardship campaign kicks off today with a reception after worship. All are invited and welcome to stay for all of the delicious food. Next Sunday, October 8th, Finance Chair Jan Chapman and Trustee Chair Bruce Kintner are offering a chance to learn about creative ways to support MAC financially. The session will be right after church and lunch will be provided so reservations are needed. If you have an interest in learning more about donor advised funds, charitable distributions from IRAs, and other creative ways to support MAC financially, please call the church office to make a reservation, send an email to me, or fill out the bulletin insert. It's blue. Please RSVP by Wednesday. As the weather is changing and you're cleaning out your clothes and your closets, if there are items that you know are no longer wanting, please consider donating them to our church rummage sale. You can contact the church office or Ernest for a drop-off time and make sure any clothing or fabric items are sealed in plastic bags and labeled. Reservations for Trunk or Treat are due by October 15th. You can see the bulletin insert for more information or contact me. The October board meeting will be held on Sunday, October 15th, immediately following worship. Please submit your reports by Thursday, October 12th. The Christian Women's Fellowship meets this Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. here at the church. All women are invited for a fun evening of faith and fellowship. And at this time, I will turn it over to Jan Chapman, our finance chair. Good morning, all. Um, as you've heard, today begins our stewardship campaign. We have so many generous givers among us, and I thank you for your commitment. 
You'll receive information by mail today, or this week, about this campaign and how you can participate. If you just can't wait to fill out your pledge card, there's some available downstairs. <laughs> Over the next few weeks, we'll hear others in the Mac family talk about what Mac means to them. I hope you'll join us in the reception today to celebrate God's generosity to us. You've heard me in the past talk about my journey, my very slow journey to stewardship. I've always attended church throughout the years wherever I've lived, but I never understood the importance of generous giving. I would put my dollar or two in the collection plate, and if I would become aware of needs above and beyond, I'd think, oh, somebody else will take care of that. A new road, a new roof, money for staff, somebody else will meet those needs. Then I came to Mac, and through the example of others, I began to realize that I could be that somebody else. So my attitude toward giving changed. Today, I ask that you prayerfully consider what you may pledge toward this wonderful church and its service to our neighbors in the community. Maybe you could be Mac somebody else. Please receive it. Though we are many, we are one body, since we partake of that one bread and share the one cup of redemption. Let us pray. God, the author of the church, the one who hopes that this, your church, 
would be an instrument of your presence in this world. But we do not understand your wisdom and the hope you have placed upon us because you have entrusted in our care the sacred work of being your voice and to continue the ministry and mission that you once began on this earth. But we come here today to dedicate ourselves as a church to ask that your spirit would lead us that we would rise up about our limitations and explore the endless possibilities that you hold ahead of us thank you for being the God who unites us oh we point fingers at each other and claim to be more righteous and deserving than others but today we know that you indeed bring us together to be one church family the church universal you have given each church its own voice and mission we pray that Today, in the midst of all the crisis, confusion, and chaos, the church would be victorious and triumphant, witnessing to the redeeming power and your grace, that we, your people who call upon your name, would be the best billboard for you in this world. We also ask that you will bless us. We ask that you will bless Madison Avenue Christian Church as you have in the past. If we live today faithfully, we would see that you would use us now and in the future. Grant us your vision, grant us your courage, guide our path, for the many dedicated leaders of the church, we give you thanks. We sometimes do not take time to notice all the goodness that happens through the life of this church. We pray, O oh God, that we would open our hearts to see all the wonderful things that we do in your name. Grant us your peace, grant us your joy. Our personal prayers we bring before you. Those who are sick, people who are in hospitals, those who are rejoicing over the wonder and miracle you have done in their lives. Peace, yes, we pray for peace every Sunday. But there is little that we do on our part that accounts for peace. We pray that your peace would begin in us and we would be witnesses to your peace on this earth. Having said that, we ask for the leaders of this world to yield to your call, to be a people who would work towards the bringing of peace on this earth. <clears throat> Those who are hungry, people who have been forgotten, neglected, we pray for those. For all those who face enormous disasters, and for those who minister to them, we pray. Continue to be with us throughout this worship service. <clears throat> Hear us even now, as we join in the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. And lead us not into temptation, 
but lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> The reading for today is from Exodus 17, 1 to 7. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people found fault with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, 
Why do you find fault with me? Why do you put the Lord to the proof? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the rod with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah, because of the fault-finding of the children of Israel, and because they put the Lord to the proof by saying, Is the Lord among us or not?
Interesting, today's scripture is about water. So I brought my water bottle here. <clears throat> if you listen to the scripture, you may get annoyed. How can these people do this? Last week it was about food. This week it's about water. What's interesting about this text is the way they complained. Last week they said, you know what? We had better things to eat in Egypt. Today the complaint is about, <clears throat> did you bring us this far so that we can die of thirst, Moses? Why is this so annoying? Because these are the same people when they were in Egypt, they cried out and said, deliver us. And now, it is constant complaint. But then, we want to pay close attention to this scripture because the complaining people in the wilderness may direct us to the throne of grace better than all the catechism and all the wrong stuff we have learned where we are told you have to use appropriate language you always have to be very reverential <laughs> I'm not saying you should not, but that is not always the case. When things are difficult, and if you are sitting there saying, I need to come up with better language, you are engaging in phony prayer. And that prayer is addressed to the one before whom no secret is hid. Look at how this text evolves. What do they do as soon as they have a major crisis? They complain to Moses. Bad idea. You know how that happens, right? When someone comes and they talk about stuff that it, you, you, don't, you don't have the time to deal with. You don't have the energy to deal with. So what do you do? kind of come up with phrases, oh, they are just venting. No, they're not venting. They want you to listen to something. Or we say stuff like, well, they'll get over it. Oh, this, that's how it always is with this person. So negative. That is how it happens in our daily living. We may be on the giving end or on the receiving end of that story. And that is what happens in this text. They come to Moses and tell Moses, Moses, are you trying to kill us? You bring us in the middle of the wilderness, dump us here, there is no water. How do you think we're gonna survive? Is this the kind of plan you had? Moses, and I've said that before, is a model for living by faith. Moses knows what to do. You and I as people of faith need to know what to do. On this World Communion Sunday, the church needs to know what to do. Moses says, this is not a complaint about me. This complaint belongs to God. And he turns to God and says, all these people are yelling at me. As a matter of fact, all of that yelling needs to be directed towards you, O oh God. Dare to complain? That is where you want to complain. Walter Brueggemann says this, the most dangerous thing you could do when you are in crisis or life in turmoil 
is to be silent before God. And that silence does not mean you are not saying anything. The silence is you are not saying how you really feel at that time. How helpless you are at that time. How abandoned you feel at that moment. That is the most dangerous thing to do. To come up with pretentious words. To come up with things that are not real because you've been told that is how it needs to be. The most dangerous thing to do in crisis is to fall into silence. It is to break the silence and dare to complain and Moses knows where to speak and to whom to speak. He knows that this is beyond his capacity and if he had to deal with it, he may yell back at the people or say, get over it. He turns and addresses the throne. The church needs to turn and address the throne. We in our personal lives need to know how to address the throne throne and you don't have to go to school or keep reading a whole bunch of stuff. What you need to do is to come before the throne in truth and honesty and God is delighted to hear you as you are. Don't, don't, don't edit, don't edit your prayer. Prayer can be as raw as raw can be. Oh, I want, to, I want to do a small detour. You want to see how Moses positions himself. I have said this before about elders, the role of elders. Moses is a model for eldership too. But the church, priesthood of all believers, this is our location. We stand between, between God and the people. And our role is to direct things to God and our role also is to direct a word from God to the people. That's what happens at the table. That's what happens with prayer honest prayer with integrity dares to speak one's heart and it may come out gibberish but gibberish is what God likes no it's not just gibberish at Halloween time it's gibberish because sometimes the pain is too much the fear is too much we do not know what tomorrow holds or where our next step would be. And that is the time you start blabbering. And if you want to blabber, let your prayer be a blabber and let it address the throne. And Moses does that. He's an expert. David does that too. I'll come back to that another day because David is much more daring than Moses was. Moses looks at God and says, God, I was happy taking care of the sheep. What do you do? You say, come, I've heard my people cry. Go to Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And I did. And now, look at me. That is the daring speech of Moses. God, I have trusted in you. I have always depended on your word. It is something that is non-negotiable for me, but look at me where I am. I am shaky now. Dare to say that prayer. Moses does. And God listens. God loves gibberish prayers, says Walter Brueggemann. And he says, when you do gibberish prayer, 
God smiles, nods head, and says, uh-huh, I'll talk to you a little later. Why? There is something Moses has to be ready to do in simplistic terms. There was a big drought and the town gathered to pray for rain. There was just one little boy who brought an umbrella to the prayer. See, Moses has to get to that point. You and I, we have to get to that point when we do our gibberish prayers. Moses is ready now. And God is ready. God tells Moses, I heard what you said. Do you have your rod with me? Yeah. Right here. Go. Stretch it. And I'll do the rest. You see, folks. Prayer, complaint, is to summon the throne in the midst of your crisis. It is not at the absence of crisis, it's in the midst of your crisis. And it is Moses' hope, it's God's desire that life gets to praise and doxology. And life will get to praise and doxology. What do you think happened when water started gushing down and people drank? What happens when your challenging moment lifts? What happens when you gain clarity and strength? What happens when you can see beyond the immediate crisis back to times when you can really be the child of God ministering in ways that God intends for you. What happens to all that? To get there begins sometimes with complaint. Begins sometimes, I didn't say this, Brueggemann said this, I'm following one of his commentary by the way. To get there sometimes takes assaulting the throne. If that is how you feel, do it. But do it as a person of faith, knowing that God will get you to praise. Complaint. Approaching the throne with courage, daring to speak the truth, Taking an umbrella, being restored to praise. To God be honor, power, glory, and majesty, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. 
Let us pray for our offering. Gracious God of abundance, we are in awe of your wondrous creation that supplies our every need. Food of the soil, the beauty of a sunrise or sunset, and the feeling of peace and exhilaration of being one with nature. We feel your presence in your creation. Lord, guide us in ways we can share your abundance of love, peace, and material goods with others through our mission to the community. Bless those who donate their time, talents, and financial resources. And bless these gifts which sustain our ability to be the good news of Christ in our neighborhood. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Today is World Communion Sunday, which you can tell from our lovely display. Christians around the world are celebrating communion and remembering their brothers and sisters in Christ. Today I would like to read a scripture for you. It's Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12. Uh, I won't read every scripture in this passage, every verse in this passage. But it has to do with the one body and its many members. You're very familiar with this passage, I'm sure. When we read it, we usually think of the church body and how we as individual members come together as a body of Christ. But today, as we think of World Communion Sunday, I would like for us to hear these verses in maybe a different light. Maybe think of each body part as a different country of believers. As we come together today celebrating communion all over the world, that we realize that it takes all of us, the world, the kingdom of God, to bring together to be Christ on earth. So starting with verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or frees, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. 
But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. I have no, if the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those, body, those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. It brings a different feeling to that scripture, doesn't it? When we think about us all being one globe, all coming together as the body of Christ. Things that are happening to our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. It brings a whole new meaning when we think about, oh, us as the mighty United States or a third world country. We're all part of Christ's body. And we think of God in his marvelous wisdom, how he has placed the bounty and the goodness of the earth all across the globe that we might work together to share our resources, that each place has fertile ground that grows different things, that has natural resources that are different things that we all must share together and glean from the earth. We are each dependent upon one another and we are dependent upon the faithfulness of God. Stand as we sing together. You may be seated. One bread, one body, one Lord of all, one cup of blessing which we bless. And we, though many throughout the world, we are one body in this one Lord. Let us pray together. As we come to this table today, Father, we ask you to stir our hearts as we have this special day to remember that all across your beautiful world 
are gathered, our beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ, coming to you today, believing in you, trusting in you, being obedient to you, coming and sharing the, the food that is Jesus Christ. Father, help us today to be reminded there is no Gentile or Jew, no slave or free, no woman or man. All are welcome at this table of love. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let us hear the words of institution as found in Matthew chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us drink together. <laughs> <laughs> 